All right, guys, here we are. Hey, guys, what's going on? We're at Nate's. Uh, we're going to be installing LiveScope today on his boat. So we're going to go over everything that we need and kind of show you how to install it and then some professional tips and tricks. Uh, I installed it once on my boat, kind of learned a few things, and then we'll kind of go over that, what makes it a little bit easier. We'll start off with the basic things that you're going to need to do this installation. So number one, you're going to have to get a unit. Uh, Nathan, Nathan got a 93 SV. That works perfectly fine. Um, it comes with a cradle. We'll go over that later. It's a very important step with that. Uh, and then you have to order the actual LiveScope box. So this is the box, the brains of LiveScope, the GLS-10. Uh, you have the transducer, and then you have a network cable uh, with an adapter. This basically just communicates um, the picture that the GLS-10 is seeing and shows it on your screen. Uh, something very important to note is this cable is only like six feet long. Two meters. So um, if you're, you know, depending on where you're going to mount your black box, so Nathan's unit is going to be up here at the bow, and we're going to mount his black box um, down here, actually in the rod locker. But my boat, uh, I installed it back here, um, and I had to get an adapter cable. So that's something to keep in mind if you're going to install it further back. It doesn't really matter where you install it, just what works uh, for your setup or where you prefer it. Just know that if you go further away, you're going to need an adapter cable. Additional $75 um, to get the 10 foot extension cable compared to the six footer that comes with it. So something to think about. Something to keep in mind. You can save $75. Um, something else we went with here. This is the standard mount that comes with it. You can put it on your trolling motor. You can put it on the uh, head of the trolling motor here, like the motor component, or you can put it up on the shaft. Uh, and then Nathan actually went with the perspective mode. You can actually turn this sideways and it kind of looks like a 360 type image almost. So this is gonna actually be installed uh, up here on the trolling motor shaft. And then something that's very important is your switch. You want an inline switch. You want to be able to kill the power to your GLS-10 or it will always be on and will draw your batteries down. So that's something that's very important. And then last but not least, um, you're gonna need a fish tape to run your wires through if you haven't installed anything before. You don't have a rope in there already. Um, and you're going to need some wire. Um, so if you look in the LiveScope manual, it has recommendations of size wires for any additional length you add to uh, power the box. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using number 10. That's what the manual calls for. Definitely do not skimp on your wire size. That's very important. Uh, these units are very sensitive to voltage and you want a maximum voltage you can get with the least amount of voltage drop to your unit. Uh, we'll cover that a little bit more later when we talk about batteries. All right, so we're gonna start with running uh, the wire from the battery compartment back here all the way up to the bow area where Nathan is. Uh, pro tip, if you ever install electronics on your boat, take the time to put a rope uh, when you pull in new wire, tie a rope to it or something that runs back. So if you ever have to add anything else, you will have, uh, you know, it pulled in already. I guess last time when we installed the graphs, we didn't do that. And uh, now we're going to have to fight it. So just a fish tape works fine. Or even uh, they make fish tapes that are fiberglass sticks that work really well too. All right. So now we got the fish tape pulled in from the back compartment uh, up to the front rod locker and we're gonna pull the wire in and we're gonna add a piece of mule string so if we ever have to pull something through here again it's here we don't have to worry about putting the fish tape through that's usually like the hardest part because um, coming through your gunnels here you oftentimes have wires uh, you got hoses and other stuff when you get closer to the motor and that can sometimes be just the biggest pain of this whole process so uh, we're getting ready for the old great wire pull. I like to put my wires on here, put a wrapper tape or two around them, and then fold them back and tape it again. That way, if you do get snagged on anything through the gunnel, you don't lose a wire or your rope. All right, so this is what the blue C switch looks like. These are super nice. Um, on the back side, you have your input here and your output here. So this is basically going to sit down here in Nate's boat like that once we get put the backing on it and then this will run over to the battery cape or to the actual battery so um all you have is just an off and then you turn it kind of hard to do one-handed but you turn it and um then it's on has continuity through these two posts back here so super easy and they will last here's your gls 10 or your black box as most people call it you have your network cable this is just the cable like i said that communicates uh to the unit 
shows the picture. Then you have the actual transducer cable. Um, that is about a 20 foot cord that we have run up to the bow currently. And then uh, the last cable is just your power cable here. If you're not familiar with how these work, um, of the, the screw on type connectors, they basically just have a little slot um, that then lines up with the slot on your cable. So it's basically foolproof. The biggest thing you wanna do is when you put these together is make sure you have it lined up correctly and you can kind of push it in by hand before you start uh, threading this in. You do not wanna bend any pins. This transducer cable has like 18 pins or something. It's really big and a lot of connectors. So you wanna be careful that you do not bend any pins. Next, we are going to mount uh, the black box up here as far as we can that has enough room. So this is his front rod locker area, um, or center compartment, sorry. And this is the rod locker. So we're just gonna go kind of as far up here as we can. That's so it's uh, out of the way, but you can still access it if you have a connection issue or something like that. All right, I got the black box mounted here in the rod locker. Uh, just some stainless steel bolts. And on the back side, uh, just some big flat washer stainless steel sucked down tight that thing is not going to bounce around or move and that is what you want you do not want things um, halfway secured you know you spend all this money on these electronics you need to do it right and make sure that they're not bouncing around and getting beat up all right so I got the black box all wired up everything soldered together um, here is the main power um, going to our inline switch in the back of the boat and then uh, I've soldered up the connection to the front graph that's the power for that the yellow little fuse that comes with it um, generally I always use a blade type fuse but we opted to try this one out it's actually a pretty tight system and like doesn't seem like there's much wiggle room sometimes the little glass fuses that are in there can kind of bounce around a little bit and give you connection problems, but we'll see how it goes. If we ever need to, we can um, solder in a blade fuse. Basically gonna take this transducer cable. This is the coil of extra that we're not really gonna need. So I'm gonna tape it up nice and easy um, and get it you know, nice and neat somewhere out of the way so it doesn't get caught on anything. And then I'll zip tie all this um, way up in here there's there's wires hiding i'll hide it all up in here so we can't see it anymore and it doesn't get caught on anything that's pretty much the gist of the black box though and a side note is on your transducer cable don't use zip ties on this especially when you connect it to the trolling motor and stuff use tape um you can actually crush the cable in here with zip ties if you go so go too tight so garmin recommends using tape while Austin was soldering, I was busy mounting the rim mount in the new unit, as you can see. Very solid, very sturdy. I think I'm going to like it so far. But I have it slightly offset so my trolling motor doesn't hit it when it goes down. And right now I'm in the process of taping the transducer down to the shaft, which then I will install, and I probably won't get to it tonight, install my um, offset bracket. So his ram mount turned out pretty good. He opted with this. Um, we looked at some options to add on to his decket mount and decided to go with this. See how it works. It looks really good and it looks like it's gonna be really sturdy. So like the Ozarks will definitely put it to the test. And my Garmin's up top, so maybe my back won't hurt from going this long. Because yours is the lowest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get an extra 30 minutes. For your head unit that clips into your actual mount, it is important to know that these things can be easily bent, so just be careful when you're taking it on and off of you that way. What I'm gonna do is just loosen the knobs here on the side and take the whole mount out with it and it all come together. But when you first clip this in, make sure you actually clip it in because that's the last thing you wanna do is if you're going down the road, have the wind catch it and blow your unit out and you'll have a huge headache when you get to the lake. So make sure you just take your head unit, it'll sit in there real nice and listen for the big deep clip check it kind of pull on a little bit make sure everything is how it's supposed to be it'd be good to go from there all right now i'll go over the live scope uh transducer installation here I had to swap over to my boat but my setup is the exact same as nathan's all right so i'll start with the transducer cable it's coming out i keep mine in this um, protective loom basically wire sock uh, it's kind of like a rod sock material is what i keep it in and then it comes up the trolling motor i keep it in a cable jacket just keep everything nice and neat and then it comes up to the trolling motor head itself. 
So the biggest thing uh, you need to look for here is make sure you keep an adequate amount of slack right here and then definitely uh, here before you secure it to the troll motor shaft first. I have basically a little rubber wire collector in here that keeps it nice and neat. I can move it a little bit each way so it's not in a bind or anything like that. But you definitely want to keep uh, a bubble of wire here. And for the LiveScope cable, they recommend basically splitting the cable like this above and below your securement points. And this is to eliminate basically rotational stress on the wire. So as far as securing your cable goes, you want to use tape or like a Velcro strap, something that has a lot more surface area and width. You don't want to use zip ties or anything that can crush this cable. Garmin advises against that. So I basically use tape here to secure my loop going up to the trolling motor. And then I leave a little bit, um, just extra bubble for rotation and stuff like that. And then I use uh, more tape here all the way down past the forks of my trolling motor. So when I'm stowing and deploying my trolling motor, there's no chance that this can ever get twisted in here and get um, pinched in this fork. All right, now I'll talk about the actual transducer mounting options that you have with LiveScope. So basically I have an option that looks just like this but is on the trolling motor shaft that's in the same plane as this. You can mount it on the actual motor of your trolling motor down here off to the side, or you can use this, which is perspective mode, which is what I have, it's an option. All perspective mode mount is, is it gives you this L bracket. And then you can, uh, if you look on here, you can see you've got a down view, forward view, perspective. And if you take your transducer and twist it around, line it up, now this is looking uh, forward best way I can describe it is like Hummingbird 360, but real time. So those are your options with your transducer mount. And to be honest, not a huge fan of the perspective mode, but I probably haven't given it enough of a chance. But when I'm fishing that shallow, which was what it is designed for, I'm usually more of just a visual type person looking at targets and things like that. And I'm not really looking at live scope or my electronics all that much. And if you're also like me, I don't want to mount it on here because this gets run into rocks and other things. I don't want to take a chance of breaking off a thousand dollar transducer. So before I had the perspective mode mount, I ran just the traditional one that is the same orientation as this, when you can switch between forward view or down view by one click or two clicks. And it served me really well and did really good, but I wanted to try perspective mode at one point in time just to see how it did. So if you decide to use the perspective mode mount, there's basically one thing you need to look at. And that is, you're gonna get two brackets and it's gonna have a letter P on it. I don't know if you can see that, or a letter S on it. And all that means is if you're looking at your trolling motor when it is stowed, is your prop on the port side or is your prop on the starboard side? Mine is on the port side. So I use the bracket with the P. If it's on the starboard side over here, then you'd use the bracket with the S. You just have to look at the directions. It'll tell you uh, how to orient all this. You come with the uh, um, thumb screws or Allen screws, I should say. When you go to tighten all this down, uh, you definitely wanna have your, your actual connections pretty snug, is it's, it's not that hard to turn this, even if you have it you know, considerably tight. Inside this bracket, um, there's a piece of rubber, and that keeps this from basically being able to twist. Uh, I know some people have trouble getting that on, in the bracket getting it flush so a little word of advice is if you are having trouble take a thin piece of tape um, put the rubber piece on there and it'll be kind of in the shape of like a c and then uh, just kind of hold it down so it's flat flush and then you can put this over top put your bolts in start tightening it down and make sure you tighten this down like from corner to corner so it's all on there even you don't have the top uh, way too tight compared to the bottom or you don't have one side way tighter than the other and you won't have any issues with that. One other word of advice is when you get all this on, you get it taped, before you get everything finalized, take your trolling motor, um, pick it up and down a few times, move it, you know, deploy it, stow it, watch everything, look where any pinch points are, anything like that, whether it's the fork or it's up here uh, coming out of your mount anything like that. Watch where any pinpoint, pinch points are and then really tape around the area so your, your wire can't move uh, and get twisted and, and pinched up. 
because that's definitely not how you want to start. So that's basically the gist of the LifeScope transducer install, and it's really not too hard. Since I'm at my boat, I'll just very quickly go over how my electronics are installed for my LifeScope and things, just to give you another idea. Um, there's multiple ways to install electronics. So basically, it comes from my battery. I've got a piece of number six that runs over to this cutoff switch right here. It's a blue C's. It's the exact same one Nathan has. And then this will run up to my fuse panel. All right, so it goes from the cutoff switch in the back of the boat all the way up here to this fuse panel. So this is a blue C's fuse panel. You can see all the fuses in there. Uh, this is the positive side. All the negative side is down here. This is piece number six copper coming in. Uh, I opted to mount my black box here in the back corner. I have a structure scan box for my Lowrance and then all my other stuff zip tied. It ends up going up into the front all the way up here and up to the bow. So Nathan, um, he opted to mount his box basically up here, his front compartment area. I could have done that, but I wanted to keep everything back here. But just keep in mind, if you want to install it back here like I did, you're gonna need the $75 uh, network cable. If you opt to do where Nathan did, you can save $75. All right, so moving up here to the bow area, there are all sorts of options you can choose from for your graph mounting. So Nathan, he opted to put his uh, Garmin basically mount in an area like this, and his Lowrance is basically in the same position that my Garmin is. My Lowrance used to be here uh, on this Decket mount, and this is a 2014, so at that time, these boats really weren't set up to be stacking all these big units and stuff up front, so there wasn't really any good options uh, that I liked for my boat. So I took it in my own hand and basically just made uh, my own bracket out of aluminum, powder coated it, and uh, mounted everything to that. So it's really sturdy. That's the biggest thing, whatever you do, uh, make sure you, you pick something that's sturdy. I can grab this mount. I can move the entire boat with it. It doesn't shake at all. The only give is the actual um, flex in the unit mounts themselves. But that's, I think, good to have a little bit of flex, but your, your base, you want that to be as solid as possible. Just wanted to show you that in case someone had different ideas or thoughts of how they could install things. Both totally fine installations. It just depends on your boat setup or if you have other stuff in the boat already and you want it to all be under one switch or you want multiple switches, it, it's totally up to you. But one thing is just do not go cheap on your wiring, connections, things like that. You already spent all this money on electronics, so make sure you spend a little bit more so all your connections and things like that are, are good and in working order so you get the most out of your unit. The thing I'll go over here is batteries. They're super important for electronics. Uh, go over what's in my boat. It's the same one that's in Nathan's. Go over some of the specs on it and things to look for when you're battery shopping to help you pick the right one. First, we'll start off by saying we are not sponsored by a battery company or anything like that. This is just a good product, so I'll talk about it. Uh, so it's an X2. Uh, it's a dual purpose, so which means it's a starting and deep cycle battery. It's an AGM battery. They are a little more resistant to uh, vibration and things like that. You never have to mess with filling them up. Um, basically, your batteries are going to be categorized uh, by a few things. Since this is also a starting battery. It's going to have cold cranking amps, it's going to have a reserve capacity, and uh, it's going to have the size. All right, so when you're talking about batteries, you're basically going to have two main types. You're going to have a deep cycle battery and a starting battery. So a starting battery would be something that's capable of producing large amounts of power, but not for very long intervals. So that'd be like starting your motor, whereas a deep cycle battery is better designed to run things with less power, but for longer intervals. So that is like your electronics, light bulb pumps, things like that. That's where it excels. You can draw it out much further and it won't deplete the battery nearly as bad as a starting battery where something like that running on it continuous all day is gonna deplete it very quickly beyond its curve. I highly recommend a battery such as that. Uh, doesn't have to be the exact same brand, but something that is dual purpose, so you get a starting and deep cycle battery all in one. Super handy, they're super nice. Um, it basically serves all the needs you need in a bass boat, so I would definitely recommend that. Now. When you're talking about deep cycle battery, there's basically a standard to help rate them, and that is a 20 hour rating. So that battery is uh, 100 amp hours is how they're gonna measure this. And at the 20 hour standard, it is a 100 amp hour battery. So what that means is it will take five amps every single hour for 20 hours to deplete that battery all the way. Now there's also the reserve capacity on there, and that is more of an automotive type um, rating where it's basically, it takes 25 amps um, and it counts 
how long it takes for that battery to get below, I think like 10 and a half volts or something like that. So it's a continuous 25 amp draw and it tells you uh, how many minutes that battery can withstand that. So that's more of an automotive type thing. The amp hour rating is much better for marine uh, and specifically the 20 amp hour is kind of like a standard because you can do 10 amp hour or 30 amp hour and skew the numbers and maybe make it sound better. But if you just stick with the 20 and compare everything to that, you'll be good. And that battery is expensive. It's like $400, but also has a four year warranty on it. And like I've said, if you're spending all this money on electronics, do not skimp out on the battery. Uh, that's the powerhouse of everything here. If you have a bad battery, you're gonna have bad electronics. You're gonna have uh, low voltage, and that's not gonna give you the proper performance that you're looking for. So another thing with voltage is if you're already running a battery and you're at your front graphs and you have the voltage icon turned on on your screen and say you're starting off in the day and your voltage is already at uh, in the 11s, upper 11s, uh, you have a wire issue. You have too much voltage drop. You did not use a large enough wire. You're not going to get the proper performance out of your units or out of your live scope box, especially things like that. It's very sensitive to voltage. Um, you do not want low voltage that's higher amperage on everything within the unit and it's just harder on everything overall so take the time to get the correct conductor sizes um, don't be afraid to spend a little extra money on it so you'll have good use of your electronics you won't have any issues so that's pretty much it as far as the live scope installation goes it's not too hard it is going to take you a little bit of time but as long as you have a little bit of mechanical knowledge electrical knowledge you'll be fine don't worry about it uh, i would definitely recommend reading through the owner's manual a little bit just to familiarize yourself with everything how everything is supposed to be wired in addition to watching this video uh, you know you'll be plenty good then you'll have all the info you need and kind of show you what to do uh, like i said the biggest thing i think the hardest part usually is running your wires through the gunnel of your boat you never know what's there it depends on your boat you know what year is it who had it before you there's all sorts of different um, scenarios of what you might have to tangle with but the biggest thing is whenever you install something yourself like this and you ever have an issue uh, you know right where to go. You know right where to start troubleshooting. You know where all the connections are. You know how everything's laid out. So that's my biggest thing because when I'm on a trip somewhere, I don't have time to be looking around uh, to see, you know, hey, what did this person do? I know exactly where I can start if there is an issue. So hopefully this video helped you and uh, we'll have another video coming up here soon on our sonar settings for LiveScope. Help you get things dialed in, what to look for, what to look past, and what not to worry about. So. Hopefully this helped. Thanks for watching, guys.